The next interview is with Jeffrey Ogle. Well, my name's Gene Horton. We're back in the Bayport Blue Point Public Library. It's Monday, June 3rd, 2013, and today we're interviewing Jeff Ogle, and he's lived in Blue Point for quite a few years, right down in Grandview Drive area. And uh, I'd like to say hello to Jeff and begin by saying, asking him what his full name is. My full name is Jeffrey Adams Ogle. And when and where were you born, Jeff? I was born in 1950, January 18th, 1950, at uh, Columbia Presbyterian Hospital in Upper Manhattan. And, and then you lived other places before coming to Blue Point. I lived when I was less than a year old in Manhattan, and then my parents bought, you know, they rented in a village on the Hudson River called Hastings on Hudson, which is just north of Yonkers. Then they bought a house, and then they bought another house, and I in basically, except for one year when we lived in California when I was a junior in high school, lived in Hastings on Hudson until I went to college in Geneseo, New York. And like a lot of people in the 70s, had a lot of experiences, traveled around, dropped out of college, went to other colleges, went to Southampton College for one semester, worked on George McGovern's campaign, and moved back to Hastings, stayed with my parents, worked, worked at IBM for a while, uh, tried to find a job, until finally somebody told me, they said, listen, why should I hire you? You have two years of college. You'll just quit when you get the money to go back. So I gave up and went back to college in Geneseo, where I met my current wife, Carol McMahon, who grew up in, among other places, Bayport was where she was living when I met her. Her parents uh, were teachers at the Bayport Blue Point High School. So when I graduated from college, I actually did my last semester at Westchester Community College to catch up on some courses, I got a job driving a taxi cab in Hastings on Hudson. And after a while, since Carol was living at her parents' house in Bayport, I said, well, let me check out driving a taxi cab. And it was Colonial Taxi, it was still here. I went to Colonial Taxi office and asked about a job. They said, sure, you could start tomorrow. It's 12 hours a day, 12 hour shift. And I said, I don't want to think about that. So I didn't, but I did end up taking a room at the Colonial Inn in Blue Point. Now we're talking 1975. And I could tell you more about that. But so that's how I ended up here in Blue Point. How'd you wind up in the house that you're in now, down in Clearview, Clearview Place? Well, then let me continue. Uh, yeah. So, in 1975, I was living at the... I had a room at the Colonial Inn for a short amount of time, and then I found out that I could... Which, the Colonial Inn is still there, but now I believe it's single-family... I mean, single-occupants rooms... It's not, the Colonial Inn actually went out of business, but the building is still there. Uh, and I, then I took a room at the Capri Motel, which is still there, which is at the um, borderline with Patchogue. And you asked me, how did I end up living in the house? And then, yeah. well, <clears throat> all right, so Carol McMahon and I got married. We rented an apartment in Sable. And we moved to a better apartment in Patchogue, but it had electric heat. And doing the math, and we didn't run the heat in the winter. We only had the heat on in one room, the bedroom, and we were paying $200 a month rent plus <laughs> electric heat. The housing market was in a low point, and... 
Carol had a friend who lived in Blue Point. And one day she says to Carol, that would be the Bollermans who lived in Blue Point, she says, the house around the corner has a for sale sign on it. So we went and looked, and the house around the corner from hers, she lived on Grandview, the house at number 20 Clearview actually had a, like you would put on a car, for sale sign on it. And then we pursued that with a real estate agent who found that the listing had expired, but the house, even though it was in foreclosure, was available. And basically, we could get it for no money down, take over the mortgage, and that's how I ended up at the house at 20 Clearview Place. So you've been there a long time. Since uh, <clears throat> the 70s? Last week, uh, <clears throat> 1980. 80. That's over 30 years, right? 33 years. 33 years, a long time. It's a relative thing if 33 years is a long time. So when we moved in, the guy who lived next door, who was an older guy, probably in his 80s, named Henry Warnicky, and I got to know him because he would come over and watch me and criticize my technique working on the house. Well, it turns out that Henry Warnicky actually built the house that he was living in next door in 1930 and was the builder, head carpenter, for all the houses in the development of summer homes that Henry Bear built. I didn't find this all out when we moved in, but over the years, because there's a community organization of the houses that were built on basically empty land, though there were a couple of houses on Ocean Avenue. Charles Bear came in and built summer homes on, you had to buy a minimum of two 20-foot lots or a 40-foot lot. The house across the street from me is on a 40-foot lot. And they did have no heat. And Henry Warnicke was... As I found out recently, the only person who lived there all year round. He lived in the house he built. Uh, He was a carpenter from Germany, and he built a substantial house, lived there with his wife, until he passed away, I believe, somewhere in the late 80s. Um, So that's a long Mm. time living in a house. And you still have that association down there, right? Well, yes. what do you each pay dues into that, or how does that work? Because I know you have a beach there. Yes, <clears throat> that's a little complicated from a lawyerly point of view. Mm. But when <clears throat> Mr. Bear deeded each house that he built, when he built it, he wrote the deed. I have researched a bunch of the deeds, and they're all different. <laughs> Some of the deeds mention access to the private beach, but the beach association, which actually holds title to the beach and pays taxes on it, uh, wasn't formed when he started the development. So the earlier houses didn't mention the beach. So the older houses did mention the beach. The beach was originally twice the size it is now, and back when the community was more, summer homes um, had a floating dock in the summer and substantial improvements on the beach and getting off the track. So the association, when I joined prior, there were people who had questions about whether the houses, if you remember that some of the houses were already built on Ocean Avenue when Bear built the others, whether they should be members or not. And then in, in the early 80s, we decided that was all a bunch of a lot of old stuff because if everybody lived in the community, they should participate. So dues are voluntary. It's not like a condominium where dues are required. Dues are voluntary. Membership is 
voluntary. We have about, as of Saturday, 26 families that are members, and the members' dues go to paying necessary items such as the taxes and insurance. And then they can use that beach if they had a little get-together. There is a locker on the gate. Yes. And agreement is that if you're a member, you can use it. The beach does have rules about bringing other people with you for liability reasons, and we don't want trespassers. No, no. And somebody puts the flag up there every day, too. I noticed that. No, actually, I, think nice I put the flag up you do that? yesterday. Yes, for the summer. it blew down, uh, and it's up. Good. That's good. It looks very, It's very pretty. Thanks. The other thing I know down there, Grandview Gardens, that whole area, you have sidewalks, which I presume is the bear, bear put in. I don't know That was one of the pluses to that in. area. Sidewalks are important for they some are. people, <clears throat> and they're important yeah. for making it a fancier development. Yes. The houses that he built, uh, there was only three style of plans that basically most of the houses, people could buy their own lot and build their own house. Some of them, uh, especially along Grandview, you can see are unique. But of the rest, there's only three styles of cottages. They were built with no heat. Uh, They have the important part of the community. They have public water to each house, but each house has its own cesspool sanitary system. Mm -hmm. But they were built, even though they were cottages, in the style of being a big, fancy house. They have uh, hardwood floors. They have extensive trim work. And they are, uh, believe me from working on my own, uh, very well built Mm. above the foundation level. Of course, all of them have Mm -hmm. had to have heat added retroactively. And there are are upstairs in those houses. Not Not all of them. Well, no. Of the three styles, the larger style had two bedrooms and a bathroom upstairs. Uh My style, which is the middle style, is actually has a CO for a one and a half story house, which is a very old, like from 1700s designation for a house, one and a half story. The half story, not intending to really be living space, to be, it has a, my house has finished floor, but there was only uh, one electrical wire for a ceiling light <clears throat> and obviously no heat and no plumbing on the upper half floor. So it's not, the CO says one and a half. Most of the houses have converted that to living space. Do any of those houses come with a garage? Originally, was there a garage or no garage? <clears throat> originally, I can't think of any that had a garage. Some okay. of them had original shed, but uh, mm. the garages have been added. Added. And are any of those homes, say, summer homes, or are they now all-year-round homes? Well, this is one of the more significant changes in Blue Point. When I moved in, the house I mentioned across the street it was owned by, I forget the name of the couple, who came out only in the summer. They were only there for two months. They were an elderly couple. And back in the 80s, I think, 90s, uh, and in the entire community, uh, there were a lot of people who bought the houses. Uh, There was a, I remember the roof on the porch was falling through and basically uh, did it while living in them, while living in them. A big important point, did extensive renovations and have sold them for good money in some cases. And the people who move in now only see that as a luxury house by the water. But no, I don't believe there is one house on Grandview. I don't see them very much. So I would put that in a category of their second home. Like a vacation home. Yeah, but not yeah. summer only. Not summers, no. no. Well, no, not summer only. Oh, <clears throat> yes. But they come out, yes. Did you know the Burmas who lived on Grandview? Of course, 
Yes, they you were members the association. Their house changed quite a bit. They're both deceased now, I know, but well, they, whoever bought when it. When he retired, yeah. uh, they moved out. It was a typical story, and yeah. they moved out, and they redid the back of the house. The house is, I think, been, it's been sold, yes, yeah, since they yes. passed on and, been, and <clears throat> redone again. Marge and Ray Burma, they were nice people. They're very nice people. Uh, but I know going by their house, it's changed a lot with the new owners down there. They rebuilt it, apparently, or something. Oh, no, wait, the Burmans? It looks beautiful. Yeah, I'm th- I was thinking of yeah. somebody else who lived on Okay. Know. But, yes, the Burmans' house, yeah. the little green house. Little that's green the house. Little, style little house. Little benches outside. That was the, that's yep. the, small, the third style. That was the smallest. third style. Right, and the person who's oh. come in now has completely changed it. Yes. Uh, to be more of a Hamptons it is. type thing. And like the, yeah. when I went by the other day, <laughs> um, I noticed he has a lawn right up to the bulkhead. Oh. And uh, that's his privilege to change yeah. it that way. But it's just an example of the changes in the community leading to a different attitude towards the community by the homeowner. Now, who's responsible for that bulkhead that runs the length of the... Well... Or is that too complicated no, even to get into? You I'm never just curious. Ask any simple questions. Yeah, there. I know, I know. It so happens that our <clears throat> preach association is in the process okay. of replacing the bulkhead, but the bulkhead is integral to this part of the stories about the community. When Mr. Bear originally built his development, he put in a bulkhead, which is about... 15 feet inland now from the existing oh. bulkhead. Um, <clears throat> bulkheads are expensive. Very expensive. Back in <clears throat> the 1960s, uh, the Beach Association property was twice as large as it is now, and the bulkhead needed to be replaced. In fact, all the properties along the bay on Grandview were in the same situation where the bulkhead needed to be replaced. Now, the Beach Association had not made any provisions for finances to replace the bulkhead. The homeowner to the east, I don't know his name at this point, volunteered saying, I will pay for the bulkhead for half of the beach to be redone if you give me the other half of the beach, which they agreed to. So the beach was cut in half. That property now is the yard driveway of the house to the east of the beach. That wasn't Hessian, was it, the Hessians? No, the Hessians okay. are now by down by where the firm is. Okay, that, that, that way, right? But, <clears throat> so they put in the new bulkhead, but they put it out 10 feet into the bay. As I understand it, they had people go down at low tide and just shovel like crazy. Now, all the houses on Grandview did that. Yes. And nobody noticed it until, I believe it was the Hessians after Hurricane Gloria or whatever, had to replace their bulkhead. Nowadays, you have to have all kinds of permits to replace the bulkhead. And they found out that the bulkhead wasn't on their property. It's on Town Bay Bottom. So the 10 feet between the bare bulkhead and the existing bulkhead is owned by the town. Everybody had to get easements, including the Beach Association, from the town. And even today, aren't they having a problem with the bulkhead at the intersection of Grandview and Bergen Lane? You know that one area where they had plywood, Uh, apparently? The corner of bulkhead that's been on the news. That's been on the news in the last couple of months. (laughs) <laughs> now, when we moved in, <clears throat> we jumped ahead here, but I'll, let me fill in some blanks. When yes. We moved in in 1980, and my daughter was born in 1980. My son was born in 1984. And when my son was <clears throat> seven or eight, as boys are, we would go fishing in the summer off the bulkhead that you now speak of, it was in pretty new shape back in, if he was born in 84, when he was 792, it was still in pretty good shape. 
I didn't remember them building it, but it must have been pretty new when we moved in 1980. And, by the way, so we would fish and crab off that bulkhead, which is on town property. That actually is the extension of Bergen Avenue that runs through the house, the furthest east house on Grandview and Neil Ferreira's house. So, over the years, it deteriorated, and the access was restricted by uh, putting uh, a sign up saying no trespassing type thing, town property, so it wasn't as popular, and it fell into disrepair. About three years ago, uh, it was to the point where you could look right through the bulkhead, and I think it was two summers ago, nobody was really noticing, uh, they came and threw sandbags down and repaired it with plywood, which did not hold up during uh, the non-Hurricane Sandy, and washed it out, now has become a point of controversy, and... uh, the new town superintendent of highways, Dan Lasquardo, uh, was down actually on Friday concerning that and concerning the drainage on um, Clearview Place. Uh, now, if we go back to the beginning of my story about them being summer cottages, they were built as summer cottages, and the people came out uh, mostly from Queens and stayed for the summer. When we moved in, by the way, Mrs. Winters, who lived on Clearview, is now deceased, lived there all year round, but um, the house across the street from me where um, Neil Ferrara, who owns the house that's the easternmost house on Grandview, uh, at that point, he and his friend Harold Brent who lived in Westchester County and worked for IBM and some other corporation, only came down on weekends and for the summer to their summer cottage. So they were summer only. So the bulkhead, I forget what we were talking about. So that bulkhead at the corner of Bergen Lane and uh, Grandview is currently under reconstruction, I presume. Well, I I saw the plans. On Uh, Friday there was... um, a big meeting of the engineers at Dan Lasquardo from the highway department, Ed, uh, the town supervisor, and other people down to make um, an inspection of that. And the Beach Association uh, property, because when they built the, the houses back in 1930, uh, and there's big question about whether the water table has come up. The drainage Mm -hmm. uh, wasn't really an issue in 1930, or at least the people weren't there during the wet season. Yes. Uh, Now has become an issue because the grade is such that the land goes downhill from the beach. So as you go down Clearview, away from the beach... It goes down to <clears throat> where in front of my house you're almost at uh, sea level, and the houses across the street we were talking about, you're almost about a foot above sea level. My <clears throat> front yard has a water meter pit, and at times when it's rainy, uh, for a length of time you can go out and find the water meter pit is full of water. However, the point is that Mr. Bear installed a street drain, like a bathtub drain, Mm -hmm. with a piece of pipe that goes from in front of my house down to the bay. Now, as of last Thursday, in conjunction with the project on the corner, our replacement of our bulkhead, they were digging, and we discovered for the first time since probably 1930 the pipe was exposed. That's only six-inch clay pipe, and it clogs up on a regular basis. In fact, they had to come on Thursday while the town supervisor was there and unclog it. 
and it was full of water. And um, the town gave us a verbal promise on Thursday they were going to replace the entire pipe with 12-inch pipe. Good. So but some good will come out of it, this hopefully. sort of brings us from 1930 <clears throat> up until now. Right to now, after Sandy. The one house down that always interests me is the brick house. There's on only the one corner? brick house in that whole area. On the corner? Yeah, it's a very unique home, right on the corner of Grandview and uh, Clearview. I know the house you mean. Yeah. Was that the builder's house or something? No. It's just so unique when you look at it. No. It is a unique design. Yes. It's not necessarily a very practical design. All of the houses that Bear built, and let's see if I could make the right analogy here, but it's sort of like when you go to Disneyland in Florida and you go to the international buildings, and I went to the... Is that Epcot? Uh, Canadian. <clears throat> yes. Yes. <clears throat> building, and you're walking up to the buildings, and they look like they're massive, yeah. huge buildings. And when you get there, <clears throat> you realize that the ramparts are only 18 inches high, Amazing. and the towers are eight feet tall instead of 30. But the the design, if you know what I mean, it's deceiving. And that little red brick house is like that too. Yeah, it's a unique house in that neighborhood. It's the only, and it, <clears throat> it's not, in my opinion, a very good idea to build on them because there's only sand for foundations, and you would have to pour a massive foundation. Sure, for the weight. To <clears throat> um, make sure you didn't get cracks. Blue Point doesn't have many brick houses, though. Most of our homes are wood construction. Yes. Now, yeah. also, by the way, the bear houses, my house included, they don't really have real foundations under them. Bear, you know, at least put down three rows of cement blocks, but oh. there's no footing underneath that. Certain areas, like on my side of the street, that causes problems with termites. Or on the other side of the street, with dampness getting up through the cement blocks, there wasn't... Right. When I bought my house, there wasn't one piece of insulation in the entire house. They were really just summer homes for many people. There were three they electrical didn't... circuits for the yep. entire house. Yeah, that was 1930, I guess, yeah. thereabouts. Oh. No insulation, three electrical circuits, and I'm still, as of today, dealing with that issue. And the, the my house, which looks like from a distance, a nice house. Uh, when you get there, um, you can only stand up straight in the center of the attic. Yeah. All right, so what else can you tell us about Blue Point? When you got here at Blue Point a long time ago, things that you remember and would like to mention? Well, let me talk about Blue Point when I got here, which is 1975, as opposed to Blue Point now. A picture's worth a thousand words, but we're not doing this in video, we're doing this in audio. So when I moved here, or when I got here, and I'm staying at the Colonial Inn, the Capri Motel, you could <clears throat> go out and you could walk there to the Carvel stand, uh, which one of the first signs of development in Blue Point Carvel stand one summer. I was really surprised. I don't remember exactly when, but they came in, knocked it down to basically slab, and but they they saved a lot of the Carvel stand. That is the basis, the interior of the Mason Olay, which is quite a substantial restaurant now at the end of Atlantic Avenue. I used to walk by every day the Blue Point Diner. Mm -hmm. Somewhere I have a picture I'll have to find, but I don't know where it was today. Uh, the Blue Point Diner was um, abandoned, and no windows, the wind would blow through it. And, but it was a nice community. I used to mm -hmm. live at the Capri Motel, and across the street, which is now an empty lot at the end of Atlantic Avenue, was an old folks' home, and they had a rooster. Oh, it would wake me up every morning. Oh. Uh, the, <clears throat> the Capri Motel, I forget the guy's name, who owned it and ran it, was owner-operator. 
I remember he had a very nice uh, Lincoln car that he kept immaculate. The Mattel was very well kept. There was a fire one one day when I was there in the gas station behind it, and everybody had to evacuate. But it was it was nice. It was a small community. It reminded a, me of the small communities that I lived in when I attended college in upstate New York. I used to live actually in a community near Geneseo called Kylaville, um, which is on the bend of uh, near the, of the Genesee River. Uh, there's a section of the old Erie Canal there. Uh, it's in the flats of the valley, of the Genesee Valley, and the population there is 26. Now, that's an extreme, but Blue Point used to give me the same type of impression of living in a community. You can't stop time. Things change. Yeah. Uh, we used to go shop at the Blue Jay Market. Oh, yeah. Which has expanded and uh, is now the King Cullen. Uh, we used to go and walk, if you wanted to, to McLaughlin's Deli. Max Deli. Max Deli. <clears throat> Jordan, uh, everybody, everybody in town came on Sunday and um, bought a newspaper there. Whether they went in, they didn't serve, a, they didn't sell a lot of things. They had a few cold cuts in the case. But it was a, it was a friendly place to go. That was Donald McLaughlin. Uh, yes. And his family. They really ran that place. Uh, the first oh, sign nice. of big development in Blue Point to me was well, Nichols Road had been put in shortly before I moved here. I remember driving on it with my wife and her saying, "This is a new road." But the first sign of big development in Blue Point was the. Burger King. Oh, yeah, Burger King. I think Burger King came here in 83. That's when they opened. That's almost 30 years ago. Well, it was the first sign of something from outside of the community coming in um, as a business venture. Speaking of the financial aspects of it, but so when I got here, I was looking for a job. And I decided that working a 12-hour shift at Colonial Taxi was no better off than where I was driving a taxi in Dobbs Ferry, where I had the, I worked from, I forget, the first train, 6 in the morning till 6 or 7 at night, but I lived in the next town and blah, blah, blah. So anyway, so working for the taxi cab wasn't good, so I went looking for a job. Now, back those days, it was still actually go places and look for the job. There was no internet or anything. So if you drove from Blue Point up Veterans Highway past the airport to the expressway, I had counted it up. There was actually three places that offered employment that you could work that were big enough. If you went up before, right right at the airport, it was the factory, which is still there, which I think is injection molding. I never went in there. Seemed to me to be just shift work. If you went up to right before the parkland starts on Vets Highway, Mm -hmm. to the left there was Dorn and Margolin Antenna, Mm -hmm. where I did go in and apply for a job at Dorn and Margolin Antenna. It was a small place. Uh, The person interviewed me, interviewing me, pointed to the guy sitting at the desk saying, well, he's been here 25 years or something. He's very good. So I did not get a job at Dorn and Margolin Antenna. The only other place I think that you could apply to work there would be the airport, which was all run by the town. You had to know somebody or something. And um, I didn't, wasn't into airplanes, so I didn't know anybody in the airplane. Or Sunvet Mall. So there was the employment up there. Was up there. So I went down towards Patchog looking for work and one of my hobbies has always been old cars Uh, my parents said even when I was three or four I had a car collection Uh, so when I went down into Patchogue there was a bargain bilge um, and where a new building now is 
Uh, going into Patchog from here, <coughs> there was um, Patchog Plating, which is now gone. Mm -hmm. And next to that was an old garage, gas station, no, no pumps, but a garage where they worked on cars. So I went in and I talked to them. So I went into Patrick Plating and I uh, went in to talk to man, it's the old guys who ran the garage and in the back. They had cars from like the 1920s. And in the shop, they had shelves full of generators and and uh, things from 1920s cars. And I asked them where I could get a job. And they said, well, go to Patrick Plating, which was two doors down, I think. So I went from the car shop, and I walked into Patrick Plating, and uh, they said, no, we don't, we're not hiring anybody. Um, I was at the marine supplies. Anyway, the salesman took me aside. So there was a salesman in the, in the building at the time that I went in there. And he took me aside and said, listen, I know where you can get a job. Go right now, get in your car, go up to Hopog to um, Raybro Drive Warehouse, a warehouse on Raybro Drive. Uh, they need people. So I drove up there and got all dressed up in like 20 minutes, drove up there. And the guy says, yep, we do need people. Can you start this afternoon? And I'm like, no, I'm all dressed up. I'll go home, get changed or whatever. And he says, okay, come back. Well, it was um, Marine Supplies Warehouse, and that was my first job on Long Island, working mm -hmm. in Marine Supplies Warehouse. It turned out to be Railroad Drive. Jump ahead to 1980, back up a little bit. When I got out of school in 1975, and I was looking for a job, and I ended up working for a um, taxi company, but I also took every single silver, civil service test I was eligible for. 1975, 76, before I moved to, and after I moved to Long Island. Anyway, I ended up five years after I took the test getting a job with the Suffolk County Health Department as a health department inspector who main office is on Rainbow Drive in Hot Bog, down the road from my first job. Of course, there's about three jobs in between. So what's that got to do with Blue Point? What it's got to do with Blue Point is that at one point I went to a civics meeting. I forget who ran the meeting. People from the town came and they showed plans and they said, all right, these are the plans that we have for industrial development on Vets Highway. And they showed them to the audience in the auditorium, and it was Blue Point Bayport people, everybody gasped because they had drawn in industrial development from Vets Highway to Hopog, which is what we have now. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of Blue Point, I think there was an exodus of people, not immediately, but after that, and changes in Blue Point, that as you had the development on Vets Highway and other surrounding areas that what I mentioned that in 1980 we moved in the housing was pretty run down it started getting built up and Blue Point became a more desirable neighborhood Bayport Blue Point and you get a change in the population the, the, the people who uh, live there because it was affordable. Um, Blue Point, by the way, tax base used to be, or the taxes were less because it was on the Brookhaven side, but your still kids still went to Bayport Blue Point School. They changed that in the 80s or something. And um, people who, as I was mentioning, Mrs. Winters, who lived on Clearview Place, her she and her husband had bought that house originally in the 1930s, and she was still living there in the 1980s. And people of that nature left Blue Point, and they're not replaced by people mm -hmm. like that. Now those houses have been what you call flipped and fixed up. The house, I hate to bring up numbers, but just for example, well, I use my house, I paid... Nothing down, uh, took over the foreclosure, 
got, I don't think you could do this today, a loan from the bank <laughs> to pay the back taxes, and, no, the back mortgage payments. It was they were foreclosed. There were uh, months of mortgage payments that had to be paid immediately. So I was given a loan for the mortgage payments. Uh, the taxes, the year I moved in, were eleven hundred dollars a year. They had just gone up from nine hundred. Now houses in that neighborhood, same house having been fixed up, is going for three to four hundred thousand. Taxes for my house. And I went and got a reduction of 10% a year after I moved in because the house was literally about to fall down. Tax, my taxes are now 6500 and they're like enviously low. So the houses are 300, 400000 for mm-hmm. a house on Clearview Place. No real changes to the house other than, you know, making it nice and pretty. Mm-hmm. And... Instead of families, you might have a couple with one kid or two adults uh, because the houses are not in down in. Um, and this is funny. Yeah. Um, I ran into when I started to work on the house back in the 80s. I talked to different contractors. A few of them I had to do work. A lot of them I just talked to. And one, but I met a lot of nice people, and um, now I go all the time get my supplies at Sable Plumbing. But uh, one guy told me, he's talking about the houses in the Bear Development, he goes, Oh, yeah, that's Tiny Town. Hmm. I'm like, What do you mean? He says, Well, we go down there and we refer to it. Yes, if you're if you're big, burly uh, repairman. And you come in and you, you look at the size of the rooms and everything, and you've got to squeeze in to fix it. It's tiny town, but it's all the water. All right, what else do we got to yeah, go? Yeah, is there anything else you want to bring up about Blue Point and what you've seen over the years and changes? Put on the record? We've, yeah. been, we've been at this for a while here. I know we are. Uh, yes. It's good. I put it on the record about... Um, Forget his name, who mentioned at the dedication of the plaque in front of the library. The Lions Club, yes. Uh, and he got up and he spoke, and everybody was surprised. Uh, he brought up that Bayport Blue Point is a community of single family homes. It took a while for that to sink into me, but what he probably meant was that yes, you need single family homes to support the community of kids going to school and whatever. I don't not too sure what he I don't know what he meant, but it was an interesting point. Mm-hmm. Uh, nowadays <clears throat> the issue uh, with single family homes is that nobody wants to buy a fixer up or anymore. I could understand the point. I'm recently retired from work. But prior to that, I did not have the time between work to our society has changed. Even with two incomes, people struggle. And I would not have the time to go to work, do the bookkeeping required with running a house, like taxes and things, and work on the house. There's, it's, can't do it. So nowadays people want to come in, they want a fixed up house, or they buy a condo. or rent an Are apartment. many houses for sale down there? I don't think so, right? No. I, I don't see many for sale signs at all. No, not now. No. no. Well, there was not a couple of years ago, in yeah. the last couple of years. <clears throat> it changes with the economy. What about your other notes there, Jeff? Anything else you wanted to... Let me see if see I have some... anything else... Clamors. We never even got oh, yeah, around to talk about clamors. clamors. Oh, there's another yeah, book over here on the back of that, that envelope. Yeah. Um, clamming. Yeah, clamming. Real quickly. Clamming yes. um, is a significant part of the history of Blue Point. When I moved in in 1980, there was so many clamors on the bay, you would go out and there would be, you could probably see 30, 40 clam boats. Sure. Uh, it didn't stop when it got cold. The bay froze over. Uh, people went out and chopped a hole in the ice and clammed. The clam legal line uh, changes and it comes in closer. 
um, so the boats it still is uh, can uh, come right up to the bulkhead almost. Uh, but the clamming as part of the economy, well, there's a funny s story. Uh, when I moved in and I had gotten the job with civil service with the county government, which didn't pay that much, I think it was 13000 or 10000 or something like that, um, the guys who lived down the street in the rental house, which is still the rental house, used to, I got to be friends with them, and they would say to me, listen, why do you go to that stupid job every day you have to get dressed up for? Why don't you come out with us and make some real money? And they were making more money than me. The clam buyer, if I remember correctly, there was a buyer who would set up on the bulkhead, at the end of Blue Point <clears throat> Avenue. But in the winter, the clam buyer would just take his van and he would stop at that property you just were talking about at Bergen and Grandview. He would set up at the end of that and he would buy the clams out of his van. And that was in winter. And that was the <clears> winter <throat> sort of sure. stop. And it was a cash business, yeah. whereas he would give you cash for your clams and it was up to you to report it, though I don't think I've run into more than one or two clamors that ever actually reported their income, and they were the professional ones who had to pay off a mortgage for a boat or something. Yeah. So they had to declare their income. Clamming was big, I know that. Um, so I never I became a clamor. I did you own a boat? Were you a boat I person? I bought a boat. You did? When shortly, shortly after we bought the house, I found an ad, and I, I bought a boat in Mystic Beach on a trailer for $60 for a 16-foot uh, wood mm -hmm. boat. And I brought it home, and I was driving it home or something, and the trailer collapsed. Uh, this is the old days on um, William Floyd Parkway on one of those side roads, and uh, <clears throat> I forget, we ended up getting a, a neighbor of mine helped me, we ended up getting the boat home, I put it up on blocks, sat there for two years in my yard, and the cats just slept in it. I never got around to getting into clamming. I remember going to look at used clam boats for sale. I think what really turned me off about clamming was the guy who was trying to sell me a real clam boat. And but he, I said, you know, that, that looks a little old and rickety. He goes, yeah, when you're standing out there and you're walking on it, you know, you stand on one corner and the other one comes up. And I, said, uh, you know, but he says, but it's okay to use. And I decided no. No. It didn't sound. And there was uh, somebody from Blue Point Sun drowned one winter oh. over on the other side of the bay. And it decided it just no. wasn't worth it no. for me. The clamors, by the way, the real clamors, the person I bought the house from, we never really got to know, uh, he was a clamor, but he moved to Texas. His wife became pregnant. The problem was that his wife had become pregnant in 1980, and she couldn't work. He was a clamor. So as I understand it, they moved. They were nice people, the Willits. He moved. They moved to Texas, and he was going to study engineering. Hmm. He's probably retired by now. But um, oh, clamming so was a um, big part of the community. Uh, not so much in Blue Point, but uh, if you went to Sable, West Sable, uh, people there, I met people who were the third, fourth generation clamors. They had nice boats, especially the West Sable boat people. They had nice boats. There are still, it's a whole story in itself. There's still some left. Do most people down in Grandview Gardens have boats? Are they boat people? No. They don't. No. 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 I wasn't sure they lived close to the bay, but I didn't know whether they actually were into boating. No. It's interesting. Uh, the only people who really, mm -hmm. well, the one family I can think of who has kids, they have a boat. Yeah. They live next to the beach, and Harold and Neil had a boat, but Harold died. Neil still lives there. I don't think he has a boat. But having a boat is a big expense. <clears throat> yes. 
And you live right on the water. Of course, you live right there anyway. Yeah. Anything else on your envelope there, Jeff? Let me look. Skating on the pond. Oh, the that pond. was. The, there were questions here about what did you guys do <clears throat> when my kids were small? We would skate on the pond on. Um, was that McGill's? McGill's Over there. pond on Blue Point sure. Avenue. Still um, popular. The town owns that pond today, I believe. Yeah, it's very interesting. Winter. Winter in Blue Point. All right. Well, we thank you very much, Jeff Ogle. That was really interesting. Yep. I, I really enjoyed that. I learned a lot. This marks the end of the interview with Jeffrey Ogle.